my spooky friends. This is John, your host from Dairyland Frights, the paranormal podcast that covers everything spooky, creepy, and mysterious in the Midwest. So, my spooky friends, uh, unfortunately, my audio dropped on this episode. So, I have Bob, Dave, and Jackie from the Whitewater Spirit Tour. And they did a great job. And I would hate for you guys to miss out on this because they talk about the second Salem, Whitewater, Wisconsin. They talk about their tour and Mary Worth, the self-proclaimed witch of Whitewater, as well as Witch's Tower, Hillside Cemetery, two serial killers. That's a little bit of a tease. You have to go on the tour to see it. But I would hate for you guys to miss out on this. So I did my best to try to edit it so you can hear them. And also Jackie from the Ghostly Gumshoe. She does a great job. She has a lot of great stories. So does Bob and Dave. So like I said, I didn't want you guys to miss out on this. You will not hear me at all on this episode, which may be good. (laughs) But anyway, I want you to listen to this episode because Bob, Dave, and Jackie do a great job. So enjoy. And please go on their tour. I will put all the links up uh, where you can find them. And uh, please, you know, they they do a great job. This is totally volunteer. They do a great history of Whitewater, the Second Salem. And you guys will love it, trust me. Uh, so without further ado, one, say hi to your ghost. Hello, ghost. And two, stay spooky. Here you go. Here's the episode. Please enjoy. So these two gentlemen actually brought me in back in 2016, actually, with a past paranormal group that I had. Um, Yeah, that's kind of how I got started with all this. And the first year I was involved with it, we got to investigate some of the locations here. Um, I think I'm one of the few that has actually investigated inside the water tower or the witch's tower. But it was kind of cool to see because... Like I said, these two gentlemen kind of have started it since day one. Um, But to go on the tour was really kind of cool because, I mean, so throughout the tour, they take you to the different locations and you learn some of the histories. um, And they have people that play some of the characters that are some of the notable ones. And they've they've done an extensive research on a lot of the history of these people too so it's not just like stories and myths and legends either so the, you know these people are were living people at the time and they've researched them really well so a lot of the facts are very true which is kind of cool for a haunted tour so now halfway through i'm still involved with it now with my personal paranormal group which is the ghostly gumshoe And I'm also on the Spirit Tour Committee, still helping. And halfway through, my group, which includes Bob himself, um, we present a, we do like a presentation at the Masonic Lodge here with some of the tales, um, what we've encountered, investigating, you know, some of the EVPs we've caught, that type of stuff. So the Ghostly Gumshoe I started two years ago now. Um, Bob came along with me from the last group I had, um, decided to just, you know, go a different direction and concentrate a little bit more on more of the local histories and stuff. I mean, I travel for my job personally. So when I go to different locations, I love to look up history and some of the, you know, the haunted legends of where it started. So that's kind of how the ghostly gumshoe came about. Yep. That's kind of how I got started. I guess I'm next in line here. I'll let, I'll let Dave go first. Uh, okay. I came to school here, college, in 1970. And uh, one of my research projects when I was in, uh, doing a, a geography class in 1973, um, was doing a, a kind of a historical look of Rick Victorian houses in Whitewater. And it was suggested I would that I should go speak to Lizzie Wright, who was our town historian at the time. And her office was down at the uh, old depot here in town. And so I'd go down there and spend hours listening to her stories. And she was a wealth of knowledge, nice lady. And we talked about, you know, 
the people that lived here back in uh, the 1860s, 1870s, and um, even earlier, like uh, Dr. James Tripp and how he was instrumental in getting Whitewater on the map with getting the railroad to come through, which was really what it took to, to make Whitewater prosper at the time. So her stories kind of ended up with, well, you know about the ghosts and witches here, don't you? And I go like, no, I don't know about it. Tell me about it. So she would just spend hours talking about, about all of the, the spirits and the, the witches and the history of the witches and Morse Pratt Institute, which, uh, you know, was real interesting to me. And it got me interested in, in the houses I was researching about, you know, the people that built those houses and why they built where they did and what they did for an occupation. And most of the, the large brick houses in town were from prosperous merchants or people that, you know, had money because it was expensive to build a brick house. Um, so she got me thinking about, uh, about the Winchesters and Partridge families that, that were prosperous uh, merchants here. They owned the, the, uh, uh, more the uh, Winchester Partridge Wagon Company, which was quite famous back in the day, and um, and how the curse of Mary Worth did them in. They, uh, yeah, it was. It's a great story. Um, Lucius Winchester, um, you know, took ill and died, and his partner, Mr. Partridge, John Partridge. He took ill and died just, you know, shortly after. A lot of Winchester's family died in a short period of time from all different causes. It wasn't like a, a plague or something that came through or the, the uh, you know, the, uh, the flu that came to, through at the time to kill them off. They, they died of all different things. And so the, the curse of Mary Worth uh, started kind of from that, I think. And Mary Worth was a self-proclaimed witch at the time, according to Lizzie Wright. And she, for some reason, was angry with the Winchesters and Partridge families and put a curse on them. So who knows? But anyway, um, but um, so it got me more interested in the local cemeteries. I would go there and visit and see where they where they were buried, look at their headstones, and sometimes there were. Uh, interesting bits of information you, you gather from the headstones, you know, how they were buried. Whitewater is kind of unique in that it, a lot of its headstones are in circles. You know, the families are buried in circles, and maybe it's just a, a way that the Victorians like to do that because Victorians quite often, it was a, as a family thing, they would go there and have picnics and you know, commune with the dead. The, the, uh, Morris Pratt Institute here was built for that reason. You know, spiritualists were were here to to uh, commune with the dead, so could have been part of that. But I used to spend a lot of time in the cemetery, just just doing uh, research on uh, the people that were notable, you know, figures here in town, uh, founding fathers, and uh, some interesting things happened in the cemetery. I would I would go in there after work and. I lived near it at the time, and I walked my dogs through there on leash. One evening, about dusk, um, I would walk my dogs, and they would stop and just along the along the, the path, and they would they were watching something, you know. And I didn't see anything, but the dogs would just stop dead in their tracks and just watch something, you know, ahead of them. But one evening, a little different. We were doing that, and they stopped. And I looked down, and coming up the hill. And, and Hillside Cemetery is built on a big hillside. And I saw coming up, kind of floating up the hillside, was a figure of a woman, uh, all dressed in black, uh, gray hair, uh, just a, a small little woman. And she was just floating up the hill. Um, she was not just like a, a ghostly figure. It was like the, the, a real woman coming up the hill, but she wasn't walking. She was just floating. And she got up to the path kind of near where we were. And she stopped and turned and looked at us and said something. I couldn't make out what she was saying, but you could see her lips moving. And 
whispering something, kind of a snarly looking face. And then she would, we would uh, continue on. And, you know, so we followed her to see where she was going. And around the curve by the, by the above ground crypts, she went in and she came up to a tree right next to the crypt and just disappeared. So hmm. I don't know what that was. Bob and I kind of were one of the founding members of the Spirit Tour. We tried to get something going, you know, years and years yeah. earlier, and the city wasn't ready for it yet. You know, there was a lot of pushback from city fathers and the local churches. We don't want to talk about our 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 spiritual history here, you know, all the witches and everything. And but our idea was to not um, just propagate more tales, but we wanted to take some of the stories that we heard, some of the legends, and see if there was a historical truth to it, what what the background was and why they started. So Bob and I are both and and Jackie was very interested in the in the history of Whitewater and how these tales started and then doing research to figure out, you know, what's the true story here. And with every legend or folklore, there is usually a grain of truth. And, you know, we want to expand on that and see why it happened. And we found that yeah, there's a lot of these stories were true and are true. And uh, so it's not just a, a legend. It, it really did happen. Um, there are some things, and I think Bob and Jackie will get more into it as far as, uh, you know, Morris Pratt and so on and, and the witches. But, yeah, it's it's really interesting to me. I, I love history. I live in a very old building downtown. Um, it it Parts of it are haunted, and you know I still see the house I used to live in was built in 1861 here, and then we had spirits in that house. And, you know, kind of used to it. You know, <laughs> things things move, things fall off shelves. Right? Some activity then. It's kind of fun. So I, I I came to the university in 1987, and uh, little did I know I'd be moving where you know Mary Worth. Um, is supposedly buried and um because i mean as a kid growing up an hour north of here we'd you know do like a lot of kids in the midwest you know it's i don't believe in mary worth i don't believe in mary worth you know and and expect to see her in the mirror or, or whatever it would be your pokey in the pokey in the in the back in the dark and, and all that and um but first thing i mean i think i was in college two weeks and everybody was already telling stories about oh there's a cornfield on the north end of town you can't if you go through there on Halloween, you can't make it from one end to the other. Um, you know, students have tried and nobody makes it through. And and we talked about all the tunnels of Whitewater, which is another thing that Whitewater has historically tried to kind of cover up that history. Um, and there's um, there are some tunnels, and we've actually been fortunate enough to to see an actual tunnel now. Uh, so can't really necessarily disclose where that is right now. Not yet. Yeah. That's a future thing. But they exist. They, you know, there's plenty of people that have been in them, plenty of people that have seen them, and now I've seen them with my own eyes. Um, but, yeah, it, it was just something way back at um, about 10 years ago, probably, we were just talking about fundraiser or something we could do for the chamber and to get some interest in people coming to Whitewater and, and said, well, what about the haunted history? So we started it out. It was spirits. It was we had a couple of microbreweries in town and we worked with them at the beginning. And it's kind of evolved just to the paranormal and the, the haunted and, you know, and the, the folklore end of it instead of necessarily the the, the alcohol end of the spirits. But, <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, yeah. So I, and over the years, you know, I've been anything from a character to a, a docent on the bus. And now I help Jackie with the presentation. Um, at the Masonic Lodge, and yeah, whatever needs to be done, we want to cover that. No, it's up to you. <laughs> so we've got two options. the The walking tour option is basically the last we heard it was pretty much filled up this year. Um, that, that we added that last year. That has been a very popular option, um, and just kind of walk to one of the cemeteries and hit a couple of spots in in the downtown area. Um, the the but the main tours are on the bus and it isn't a, they're not jump scares. They're not, 
gory. They're not scary. Um, I don't know that I would recommend bringing kids under 10, but I don't think it would be that bad for them either. Um, but it's really more based, like we were saying, on, on history. Um, there's, you know, two um, female serial killers from Whitewater. We've got some really great characters on the on the tour. You get to meet some historical figures from Whitewater, and uh, it's I would say more history based than it certainly isn't scary. No, if anything, it touches like I said, it touches a lot on the history, but obviously, like I said, you got the legends and stuff, and everybody's you know always talking about the witches and stuff like that. Well. Like I said, they've done some of the research to find out, okay, how did that start? And that's kind of what the spirit tour kind of walks you through. It takes you to some of these locations that are, you know, some of these legends and lore, and you actually get a lot more of the truth of the historical part of how that came about. (laughs) Oh, definitely. I'll let you talk about Mary Worth, Dave. Well, I first heard about Mary Worth from Lizzie Wright, the, the town historian. and she said that Mary Worth was a self-proclaimed witch. And so the, the legends of Mary Worth are, you, you hear Mary everywhere, you know, about throughout the United States. In Whitewater, it seems to be kind of the, uh, the focal point of, of where Mary Worth maybe existed. We haven't found her grave yet. Um, we've heard lots of stories about where she may be buried. Um, the, the legend here is that Mary, uh, when she came to the end of her life and was was quite ill, she said she wanted to be buried in Hillside Cemetery. And the, the, the local uh, uh, managers there, uh, the board said that, no, you can't be buried in hallowed ground. So we won't allow a witch to be buried in our hallowed cemetery. And she said, if you don't bury me there, I'll curse this whole city. So the legend says that they put her in an above ground crypt. She wasn't buried in hallowed ground. She was above ground. So a loophole. <laughs> so she may be there. We don't know. You know, there are there are two crypts, uh, actually more than that, just three crypts. But there's two crypts that are fairly well known now in Hillside. One is called the Public Crypt, which was the uh, temporary holding uh, vault for bodies uh, during the winter. It was too difficult to dig graves in the wintertime. They didn't have the big machinery they have now. So they would put them in cold storage, basically an above ground crypt called the Public Crypt. And there are racks inside the crypt, which are still there. And well, get to and see. You, and you do get to see those on the tour. Yeah, and go in. The crypt is open. Yes, uh-huh. the crypt is open for the tour. Yep. So that we would store bodies. It would probably hold a dozen or so. I would guess. Yeah. Coffins there. Uh, so in the springtime, when the ground thawed, then they would dig, you know, the, the graves and put them in their final resting, you know, graves. Um, but right next door to it is another crypt, and it's kind of a mysterious one. And we aren't quite sure uh, what happened there. But uh, I, when I was in school here in the 70s, in uh, about 1971, there was a break-in of that crypt. And vandals had uh, uh, destroyed some of the, uh, the, the coffins and, and scattered bones of those that were in those coffins in that crypt. And they also took one of the... There was a baby coffin there that they removed from there and took it over to the campus and put it in the fountain. I was going to class and I saw this gathering of, of people around the fountain and there was this baby coffin in the fountain. So the police came then and, and took it back and replaced it back into the into the proper crypt. And uh, then the gates to that crypt, the doorways were welded shut. They didn't want anybody breaking into it again. So a terrible thing to happen to desecrate the graves, you know, but or desecrate the you know their the resting place of, of those people. And there's a, a few coffins still in there. Um, but anyway, um, so the legend was that Mary Worth was buried in that in that crypt. We don't know 
that for a fact, but you know, it's kind of mysterious that uh, there aren't too many records about Mary Worth. Um, the census of what, 1895? Yeah. 1890, yeah. The, the census was burned in a, in a fire. So the records were lost. So that, that whole, that whole uh, census was, was lost in the fire. Well, it doesn't it doesn't help with the fact that that crypt also the top of it where normally you would see like a family name and stuff is all kind of been um, sandblasted off. And I think I remember that I remember when I was in there before this happened I was when I was looking at uh, you know looking for grave sites uh, historical grave sites I remember that crypt very well and and the 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 uh, inscription on top of the crypt was pretty plain. After that crypt was broken into, that was removed. I think people to, to obscure it so people wouldn't know where to look, you know, for Mary Worth, so it's called the Morgan Crypt. I, I can't say it was specifically Mary Worth that we were trying to conjure. Um, that was 35 years ago, and it might have been after a partaking a little bit that evening um <laughs> but yeah yeah sir sure, done yeah yeah a few spirits myself um but yes did the ouija board um near the cemetery on campus and it i doing the ouija board there and in a couple of apartments um when i was in college it really freaked me out because the answers that you get were way too accurate and um, yeah, I haven't done the sense. So I wouldn't say the cornfield was necessarily connected to Mary Worth. It was just, I just remember as a freshman, you know, that was one of the things they'd try to scare you with, you know, because the campus butts up right at that point, right up to farm fields. And, um, and that was always the legend was that the cornfield just on the north end of campus that you you couldn't you couldn't go across it you couldn't make it all the way through um, from one end to the other on Halloween. If the spirit the spirits would get you. The children <laughs> I, that might have been before children of the corn. Not really that I've because I've actually delved into I couldn't tell you how many records here and still do. Um, the amount of rabbit holes I go down is is scary, I'll tell you that. Um, but I haven't found anything that even says anything like that. No, I think I think Mary Worth is pretty well known in this town. The legend of Mary Worth is is pretty pretty common. Um, but I don't. There was no trial. I you know. That, I think the records of her have been just lost yeah if there uh, if there was a real person of mary worth there's no record of her uh, i remember uh speaking to a elderly uh person i won't mention his name but he was the chairman of the cemetery committee at the time years ago and we talked about mary worth he said you don't want, you don't want to talk about her and I kept pressing him for more information and he said, is she buried there at Hillside? And she said, don't talk, we don't talk about that. And then he finally said, she's been removed or relocated. relocated. And that was it. Don't want to talk anymore about it. So very mysterious. Well, there's still some tickets left for the bus tour. You should come. So, <laughs> so I, I, I've got experience with that one too. <laughs> so, again, my my freshman year was pretty eventful <laughs> when I started here in Whitewater, <laughs> and this would have been actually on Halloween night. Um, we ventured up to the water tower. And we decided that we were going to jump the fence and go in. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at that point, it was just more like a chain link fence. And at the top, you had barbed wire, but it was pointed in. So, you know, most places have barbed wire that's pointed out to try to keep you from getting in. Well, this was tipped inward. So it was almost like it was trying to keep something from getting out. 
from inside. And had it not been had it not been one of my shoelaces catching on the barbed wire, I might have wound up inside the gate that night. A friend a friend of mine did, and I, he. Again, this could have been maybe alcohol induced, but he was trying to climb out a couple of times. We were trying to help him out. And he kept saying, dude, something's pulling me back. Something's pulling me back. Dude, something's got me. And when he came out, he had where barbed wire had had gotten him on the palm of his hand. And I don't know. I look at mine and I don't see marks. But anyways, it formed like crosses. It formed crosses on both of his on both of his palms with the blood. But yeah, he was the one that got into the into the um, water well he didn't get in the water tower but he got inside the fence and then the cops might have done a patrol around there and i learned how to climb a tree really fast and <laughs> so but, but yeah no so even then it was you know that was again one of the one of the legends that you start hearing as soon as you're a freshman you know was that the the witches used to surround the water tower and they would conduct seances and practice the witchcraft up by the water tower uh, whether it was the water tower drawing energy for them or if it was just because at when it was built it was a secluded area of town um, but yeah so that's that's where the where the name came from and everybody just refers to it as a witch's tower and everybody knows exactly what you mean and my daughter came to a basketball camp or went to a basketball camp there and her friend wouldn't even sleep in her own room because they could see the water tower through their window. <laughs> so, so even people that, even people that grow up in white water still, and yeah, it's pretty superstitious. Yes. So actually, originally when the back in 2016, when I started with this, um, they actually had on the tour where you could actually go in the water tower on, on the tour. Um, and at one point, I did get a chance to actually spend a few hours there and investigate alone. And a couple odd things, you know, noises with inside where you really shouldn't hear noises um the way the water tower is built it's like it's solid stone it's about eight foot thick um to get in there's a solid steel door in the front which actually came from an old prison from like a solitary so i mean it's a thick metal door and then as you enter in there's another door and then you actually go into the water tower. So, I mean, with both those doors closed and eight foot thick walls, you really shouldn't hear anything on the outside. And definitely caught a couple EVPs inside of, you know, like a cough and a dog barking, which I don't understand that one still. But, I mean, yeah, been there. One of the tours that we did a few years ago, my wife was on the tour and we were, you know, standing there listening to the speaker give the history of the tower, and um, I wasn't real close to her, but she said something poked her in the shoulder, and there was nobody around her. And then when we had gone inside the tower, uh, we were standing in there, and the tower is actually big enough to hold about, you know, 40 people. So we're all inside, and the door going in was open. There was no wind that night, and we're standing there listening to a uh, presentation inside the tower, and the door suddenly slammed shut. And there was no wind there, that caused that. It just closed. And, there was no, there, and I went and looked, and there was nobody outside either. No. So. Well, that. And that that same that same year, in fact, it was probably the same presentation. The gentleman that was giving the presentation was very very familiar with the water tower and spent a lot of time in it. And there was like a gust of wind that came through, and you could hear it echoing in that water tower. And he stopped his presentation and looked around. And was like, well, that's interesting. That hasn't ever happened before. Uh, again, so um, like like Dave's wife had experienced. We had a couple of people at one of the stops that we don't make on the tour currently and um same thing she had had felt like somebody poked her in the back 
and she was wearing a backpack and she felt like somebody had grabbed it. She had purposely sat at the back and stood at the back. Um, she didn't want to be in the crowd, but yeah, so she, yeah, she came up and she told me about it afterwards. She was pretty freaked out about it. Um, and I don't know if we've ever had any dread, but we had, no. we had a gentleman bring some, some equipment along with him. And again, another, another house that used to be on the tour, um, that we don't have access to anymore. Uh, he was getting all kinds of like EMF readings, um, in that house at a couple different locations. I mean, I know one of the, one of the years I was on, I think I was with you as a DOS and on the bus tour. And we were going through Hillside Cemetery, and as the character from Mary Worth was presenting, I could have swore I saw a shadow, you know, walk up and down the hill, too. So. And actually, when I was, I was leading the tour going up to the crypt area, and I was walking backward, just talking to the crowd behind me. And I happened to look over my shoulder, and then down the hillside, not too far from our lake, there were some trees, and I saw someone, something, poke out from behind the tree and look up at us and then go back. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Yeah. It was pretty dark down there, but the, yeah. but the way the moon was, you could see, you know, the reflection of the, of the person. So not sure what that was. I, I know one year there was one girl that did get sick, but that was also alcohol induced. So I don't know if that was paranormal. Yes. So um, the hillside is the second. It was the second cemetery that um, came into use in Whitewater. Um, the first one is actually a retired cemetery, and we used to go up there. Um, and we still, it, it, the tour will actually go past it. Um, but at Hillside, yes, we actually get out and you're able to walk through the cemetery. Um, and as Dave alluded to earlier, um, so some of the some of the more well-to-do families, um, there's a couple of areas, um, the Winchesters and the Partridge. And, and yes, we had a Partridge family in Whitewater. Um, <laughs> and, um, they, yeah. yeah, right. And, but, yes, yes. <laughs> and um, so they those families are buried in circles. Um, and there's another area of the cemetery where um, there are semicircles that all of the all of the headstones are are form. Uh, but yes, you'll walk through. We, we point out a couple of the 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 highlights in the cemetery, and we go up to the public crypt. And again, that would be open, uh, and people are able to go in there. The first year that it was open, when we opened it up walked in there and there's this overwhelming smell of flowers i remember and I was that. like mm -hmm. oh my god that is weird i was it just creeped me out so i was i was talking to the um what's the sexton the sexton of the cemetery and he just started laughing and i was like what what i said that was really creepy why are you laughing he's like well because when we took all the flowers off of the off of the gravestones he said, getting ready for fall, and we put them in garbage cans. He said, we just stored them in there. So that was why the smell of the flowers, which made me feel a little bit better. Yeah. But, yeah, that was, I mean, that just kind of added to the whole ambiance because everybody could smell the flowers. Which, actually, but, you still can once in a while. You can. Um, but so then there's another there, there's another presentation in the cemetery, and that's a cemetery where a lot of the – um, the the founding fathers are mostly buried at at Oak Grove, but at Hillside there's still a lot of very recognizable family names and um, but yeah there's a, a nice tour through there um, with a lot of information given. And Hillside is actually where Morris Pratt himself is buried. Correct. So I mean normally so like quick quick brief thing. So that it starts in one location. We have a couple presentations. Um, so Carol Cartwright, who is um, the local historian now, she does a little bit about the history of spiritualism. Um, this year, I was lucky enough to secure a lady, uh, Stacy, who was with the Morris Pratt Institute currently, because um, the Morris Pratt Institute is still active today. It is out of Milwaukee area. Um, but it is still active today. So she's actually coming this year and giving a presentation about the Morris Pratt Institute, um, what it did, kind of how it, you know, some of the beliefs and stuff. And then they start on the tour. Um, like I said, they go to 
hillside and they do walk them through there and you learn a little bit like i said they tell some of the history there uh there's a couple characters there and like i said morris pratt himself is buried there so morris pratt i think kind of started in my opinion kind of started the whole witch stories um so morris pratt himself actually believed um he had actually gotten into spiritualism and so yeah Mm -hmm. yes so spiritualists back then and actually today still uh they believe in communicating with the afterlife and the dead through seances uh mediumship automatic writing and the current school today they actually have a whole curriculum of that you can still attend classes um there's actually quite a few spiritualist school not schools but like camps they call them and you can go there and you can actually learn and earn certificates and stuff and you know develop more of your psychic mediumships um they do automatic writing still so Norris Pratt had actually kind of happened upon spiritualism and in his time in his life he had gone to a an event and met a lady and along that time he actually had what he would call a Native American spirit guide and he got directed to buy some property and it basically ended up having some ore on it and he did he made money um, when he sold the property, and he had said if he ever made the money, he would build a school just for spiritualism. And that is where the Morris Pratt Institute started and was built here in Whitewater. And over the and it's actually interesting. I've been do I'm still doing a lot of history research on that. So the Morris Pratt Institute actually was built here in about 1889, 1890. And they, I mean, they had People from all over the country, and actually at one point there was a prince from Arabia, I believe, that was here attending some courses too over the years. And then they also hosted a correspond like correspondence courses as well. Um, but yeah, they would have people that would li- like kind of like UW Whitewater here. I mean, they would come just to learn and harden their craft. Female serial killers, not just serial killers. Female serial killers. That that's really kind of for the tour, but <laughs> I mean, one of one of them. I will I will say one of them. There is yeah, there is a book actually about one of them that Linda Godfrey had actually written, um, called The Poison Widow. Um, but yeah, that's actually it's based on a true story, a true lady, and yeah, they believe yeah. When you learn the story, she was definitely a serial killer. Or attempted Uh, attempted, serial killer. Attempted. Ooh, I'm trying to remember. It was early, early, it was after World War One. Um, so it would have been in the twenties, I believe, is when it happened. Nineteen twenties. Yes. We do. Yes. She she she's actually she joins us on the tour and tells her story. Um yeah. And if your if your audience wants to research it, her name is Myrtle Shouty. Yes. S yes. C H A U D E. And her husband is actually buried her husband's buried in Hillside Cemetery. Yes. And his body was exhumed. I won't give it too much away, but his body was exhumed and then provided the evidence that he was poisoned. But the, her story is wonderful. And the reenactor that gives that story does a great job. Oh, she does a phenomenal job. She she alone is well worth going on the tour. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the one. The other one is for sure a, was definitely a serial killer. Mm-hmm. Um, she basically killed her family for the inheritance. <laughs> yeah. Um. No. No. no they, they actually. I mean, they didn't. They didn't even start here. They actually had moved here. Um, but yeah, she ended up ultimately, yeah, poisoning her family for inheritance. Yeah. Um, oh, geez. I hate, I hate that. I mean, honestly, I think the biggest one that has ever still stood out to me is years ago, I was, I had started with, um, WPI, if you know, Jade Pachochin, um, with, you know, Jay's been doing out in the kettle, which I've, I've 
actually I've taken Bob with me a couple times now. There's some stuff out there. Um, but with WPI, we had gone to Ohio State Reformatory, Shawshank. Great building, love the building, love the architecture. Um, but probably one of the first times I was there, it was, we were up in the, I think it was the TV ward. Um, we were setting things up and and it's it always seemed to happen to us when we were setting up at the time. Um, one of the guys on the team, he was our biggest skeptic at the time. And he comes down and he's white as a ghost. And I'm like, you know, what's going on? He goes, I don't even know how to explain it. I said, what do you mean? And he's like, I set the camera up. I turned around. He goes, and there was a face right in front of me. Like it, it was a guy like squaring off. Like he was going to basically beat his butt. And then it just disappeared. And I was like, okay. I said, so explain it. He goes, I really can't. He goes, I, you know, I don't know. So then him and I go down on one of the cell blocks and we're setting up another camera and I'm, you know, we're kind of, he's hooking the, the, the camera up and I'm feeding the wire. So obviously at the time we were still using wires with DVRs and it gets pulled out of my hand. And I'm like, dude, what'd you do that for? He goes, what do you mean? I'm like, you just pulled the wire. He goes, no, I didn't. I'm like, Okay, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I mistook, maybe I dropped it, whatever. So I go to hand it to him again, pulls out of my hand. And I'm like, what is going on? And it's just that place is, I've had so many things happen there that is probably one of my favorite places. And I've had some of the best experiences there. I think I probably got one of my best EVPs there ever. Um, and I actually have it on my Ghostly Gumshoe website too. Um, yeah, we uh, we were actually, look, you know, and this was like years ago before it was even cleaned up like it is today. I mean, I am amazed at how well they have done to help with the pres preservation of that building. It is it's just amazing. But back then, you know, they kind of walk you through and there's, you know, there's some stuff on the floor and stuff so you don't trip. But uh, we were, you know, they tell you the story about the warden's wife who was looking for the hat box in the, in the closet, gun falls off, shoots her in her stomach. She died three days later. And there was a rumor also that that had gone around again, rumors that they were going through a messy divorce and the husband hired a prisoner to come in and kill her and all that stuff. So as we're walking through me and another girl, you know, we, walking you know we're like okay you know let's see if we can figure out what room this happened in so we're like walking through and you can hear it and we're like well you know maybe she would have put it in this closet and all of a sudden you hear a scream a gunshot which actually the gunshot is so loud it echoes over our voices and then there's another scream that is even louder we didn't hear it at the time at all i didn't hear that until i got home and that is still probably one of the best evps i have ever gotten yeah that's fucking it doesn't disappoint, man. Uh, so I guess I still would describe myself as a skeptical believer. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I think there's a lot to the paranormal. I think there's a lot of things that happen. I believe people, when they tell me that they've had different experiences, I I still I think sometimes there's there's certainly explanations and the longer I do this there's more and more things that have happened that we can't explain so I'm becoming more of a more of a, a real believer but I'm still pretty step skeptical um, there was a, a location in Whitewater that we investigated and this was probably my first aha moment um, and and I'm not I'm not real big on on like a spirit box because so many times you can interpret things the way you want to interpret it, hear what you want to hear. Um, this was the first time we were using a, a new one that our group had, and it was pretty clear. And we were asking questions, and the questions that were answered were were dead on. Um, it said how many of us were in the room. It repeat it back a couple of our names um at one point it said inca it's like well that's a weird that's a weird word so 
And, you know, so we kept our EVP session going. I'm looking around the room and they've got these great, these great books and they had stuff on like strange Wisconsin and all these, you know, books. And, and I'm noticing these little terracotta figurines and I'm thinking, well, those look kind of like Peruvian, you know, they, they look, you know, something. So I asked, I asked the, the homeowner later, I said, well, where did you get those? She's like, well, I said, are those Mayan? She's like, well, some are Mayan. She said, but most of them are Incan. I was like, oh. So I was like, wow. So we heard Incan, you know, and then I started noticing these terracotta figurines. We had actually asked about, um, about an election recently, you know, before that. And, um, they had mentioned, you know, because the former owner used to like put lights in the window, like who won the local elections. So like, you know, red, red for Republicans, blue for, for Democrats and it said blue or the answer came back blue. I mean, so when you're getting direct responses to your question and it was just after Governor Evers had been elected, um, you know, so I was like, all right. Well, that was that was dead on, too. But and we had some great, great EVPs in that house as well. And we saw I, I still think it's a shadow. We haven't been able to totally debunk it. We haven't been able to prove what it was either. But there was it looked like a shadow arm come into the one room on the camera. Um, but we had some great EVPs there. So that was that was really the night that I kind of turned a corner and started believing a lot more of this. <laughs> Pretty much daily. <laughs> My wife and I live in an apartment where it's it's in a very old building, and what's funny is because I I own the building, and back in the '60s, my sister came to college in Whitewater and lived in the very same apartment that I live in now. So I I spent time visiting her uh, back back in the late '60s. Um, but we have a, a resident uh, spirit, uh, and he seems to be the spirit of a, a young boy, um, and kind of putting two and two, to, two, and two, and two together, it, it, it's because uh, while my sister lived in the apartment, the apartment next door, um, there was an older woman living there who was the grandmother to this young boy, and he would come and visit her. Um, fast forward a, a few years when he was in high school, he and his girlfriend were out driving too fast and hit a tree and were killed. And he seems to be haunting the house that's near where he died. And then he also haunts the house of his best friend in high school. They worked on cars together. And I know this man very well. He lives just not too far from where I live. And he says that uh, this spirit comes to visit him all the time and play tricks on him. He's a prankster. He would hide things on him. He would, um, for example, he'd be this this gentleman would be working on his car. And he'd take his hat off and put it on the workbench behind him and get to working, go back, get his cap, and it's gone. He looks around for it, finally looks up, and it's up on top of the rafter. Things like that. It's practically built. And that's the same thing that that my uh, spirit does to me. He hides things. He he moves things around. Uh, almost weekly, at least, things will just be shooting off a shelf, or or be hidden. We'll find it in the strangest places. You know, um, it affects me at, at work. He'll he'll hide tools, and if I'll, I'll go searching for something and find it in a place that you'd never expect. So. But why he, why he identifies as a young boy in my apartment is because that's where he was happiest, probably, when he was visiting his grandmother. He associates being a high schooler at my other friend's house because that's where they were happy together. And he messes with the people that live out by where he was killed. He'll... He'll mess up their records. He'll he'll just hide things and, and mess things up for them. And it's just like he he associates or identifies with where he was at that stage of his life, you know. 
So it's kind of weird, but it's just something we for. And also we found out that from history, my apartment was an old uh, music studio. And the gentleman, this music teacher there had a piano. And we're quite often will wake up in the middle of the night hearing piano music and people talking. So, <laughs> yeah, I get different mediums come in and, and they will say, well, he's he seems harmless. He's just a prankster. And she she saw him. She she described what he was wearing, what age he was. And that was the same age as when he visited his grandmother. Whitewater's got it all. <laughs> Yes. Yep. Yes, actually, that uh, that actually kind of sparked one of the uh, stories that they tell over at the water tower. Oh, I don't I don't have a podcast yet. I kind of just I kind of blog as I travel. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.